Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between New Art School and Design Deducts Podcast. Our guest today is Jennifer Whitty. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me here. Great to uh, be it's here. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, so tell us about you. Yeah, um, well, I'm, um, I'm a systems design educator, researcher and designer with about, I think it's about 12 to 13 years of experience in the field, broadly speaking, of sustainable fashion and textile systems. And so I wear many hats in my role, but my research and practice kind of focuses mainly on where fashion and design intersects with holistic systems, ecology, designing for transitions, um, zero or minimal waste thinking, social innovation, the entire value chain, equity, resilience and designing for post growth. So I'm originally from Ireland, um, but I've worked as a designer and educator in, I think it's now New York, Paris, London, um, Wellington, New Zealand, Copenhagen, Dublin, Donegal, um, Limerick, Tallinn, Estonia, Xi'an, uh, Shanghai and Beijing. Wow. And I'm current. Yeah, <laughs> I get around a bit. Um, yeah, a bit of a itchy feet, as we say in Ireland, a, a global, yeah, yeah I, li I like to kind of think a bit globally. And I'm currently now the coordinator of fashion systems, um, sorry, fashion systems pathway at Parsons New School in New York, um, where I'm also an assistant professor of fashion systems and materiality. Fantastic, um, fantastic. And, mm, thank you. So tell us, tell us about what your latest projects. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I was saying before, yeah, I think it's, um, we're super lucky with um, within our role as academics that we get to wear lots of different hats at different times of our career and different times of the year. So there's always kind of one one thing winding up and another thing winding down. Um, at the moment for us, we've been winding down the intense period of teaching. Um, our thesis students have just graduated and finished their projects that they've been working on for a long for over the course of a whole year. Um, and I teach into the fashion systems um, pathway, which is one of the first, to my knowledge, of its kind in the world where we look at fashion from a very, very broad perspective. So we had students doing a whole array of projects from um, looking at fashion and film as a way of slowing down the fashion industry to um, in this COVID environment where students were spread all across the globe. One of our students was back in India and she was working with her family's manufacturing um, business and looking at how she could increase transparency and more eth ethical practices in the supply chain. So, and then my own research is kind of um, gearing up and this is where we get to create new knowledge and fill our own cup. And I try to strike this balance with practice-based research where mm. I'm making design work in some form. So that can be services, systems, or products. But I also get to try to get a balance of that with my scholarly work where I reflect on what I've done and try to disseminate it with a different audience in mind. So um, I've got a few projects on the go. I'm I was very fortunate to re receive, sorry, a four-year funded scholarship um, in China, it's the thousand person scholarship. Um, I've been going to China regularly since 2015. I first went over for a conference and I've been really lucky to build lots of relationships since I've been going and every year a new opportunity comes up. So at the moment, this four year, multi-year, multi-stage program um, in Xi'an. So that's, um, you might know from the Terracotta Warriors, it's the one of the ancient yeah. ca capitals of China. And we're looking at, I'm working with Chinese academics and we're looking at how we can rethink and reimagine fashion practice for systemic change. So I think there's approximately about 10 different researchers I'm working with there. And we're looking at how we can use practice-based uh, practice based research to, to lift their education system and to disseminate and to, to have impact into the industry in China. Um, you know, as the workshop for the world, anything we do there is going to have, have an impact. Um, I'm also just finishing up um, a role we've been doing, myself and Noel Paloma Levinsky from Kent State University, where I've been a co-editor of a special issue of, um, of a journal called Fashion Style and Popular Culture, um, published by Berg and, um, sorry, Intellect, whoops, <laughs> wrong publisher. And our special issue is um, a sense of time and place. So as the kind of the dominant 
speed of industry and consumption is very, very fast in fashion mm. and the mm. average and very short where the average garment is only worn seven times, where we're locked in this linear um, progression of temporality. We, we poised this, um, sorry, posed this um, topic to look at different, um, looking for diff a call for different papers from across the globe. And my own paper for this journal queried how much of what we think and know about clothing from production, design, aesthetics, use and disposal is patently out of sync with our current time mm -hmm. where we, you know, a lot of our values and models belong to another epoch when our relationship and our understanding of our place and our home in the earth or on the earth was markedly different. So I'm, what I've been posing with my exploratory papers was looking at um, how we could interconnect more parts of this system and consider planetary boundaries and a multiplicity of voices. Could we reimagine the fashion system as part of nature, a whole place that honors and is conscious of different worldviews and different uh, modalities of time? Um, another project I'm involved in is called Taoist Mind, Body and Clothing Service, and that's being developed with Yan, Professor Yan Yuan, who is one of my collaborators um, in Xi'an, China. And that's part of a collective called Enclothe Transcendence, um, led by Fiona Deffenbacher at Parsons School of Fashion. And it's looking at how clothing can act as a mediator between various bodies, states and environments and how the lived experience of embodiment at the intersections of design practice, religion, philosophy and sociology can speculate on this space in between the body, clothing or without clothing. And, and our work has kind of come about a little bit from my own, my despondency with Western ontology, which divides the inner intangible self as being deep within and far from the kind of surface of superficiality or triviality that fashion is often um, put into. So mm -hmm. I, th I think when looking at ancient wisdom from Asia, it acknowledges the intrinsic connection between the inner and exterior and fashion can be taken maybe more seriously um, for the power and the magic that it can yield. Um, so mm -hmm. looking at the dualism of kind of Chinese science and philosophy, this could look at kind of the imbalance of the yin and the yang and the energy bodies. So we're, um, I'm embarking on this and it's, you know, obviously such a huge, rich topic. It's um, something we're dipping our toes into over the next few months. Um, I'm also an ongoing lead of a project called Space Between, an activist platform I've been running since about 2015. And we're currently, myself and my research assistant, Tapaya, we're deep in a relaunch um, where we're gonna be redeveloping what we stand for. And we're gonna be looking at developing workshops um, along the lines of sustainable systems mapping, social innovation, more human-centered design strategies that we can be um, imparting to individuals or industry partners. Um, and then I have my ongoing advisory roles with Fashion Revolution, the Union of Concerned Fashion Researchers, and I'm in discussion with Mindful Fashion. It's an industry representative of the New Zealand fashion industry, um, where we might be looking at working, running workshops and providing resources so that their members can take action and hopefully bridge that, that gap between our emergent um, students coming out of the academic institutions armed with a lot of sustainable knowledge and how that can actually translate into practice in the industry. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> busy you, on you, all. Do, do you sleep at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, that's very interesting. And, and, and uh, I'm especially interested in, in uh, practice-based research. How can this research reach mm -hmm. the production stage? How, how how do you do you think that your 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 findings can actually have an effect uh, on this on this wasteful production of of, of, uh, of fashion items? Yeah, um, hopefully it will. And and there's many many people in this field. I'm I'm building on the shoulders of of many giants out there that um that are have been doing that. So some people um, will work with industry partners. Some people have been doing like pilots or trials with industry. So they might look, um, a colleague of mine 
um, was brought on board as part of her PhD to work with um, industry partners to develop zero waste practices. So look mm -hmm. at some of the garments in their supply chain and their production run to develop um, what, what they call in industry markers. So the, the, the kind of relationship of the pattern to the to the fabric to try and get less yield in their production. So that would have a direct impact on um, on the garments that they're putting into production. Um, but also I think it involves looking at different stakeholders in industry. So we ran a project for a few years where we worked with um, corporate uniform uh, suppliers and makers. So within this particular business model that they had, um, when these uniforms became surplus to requirement, they were sent to landfill. So after somebody had, um, you know, maybe left the business or had damaged the garment in some way, all of these garments, because of the risk um, of security, because of the kind of <laughs> integrity of the logo. Yeah, if somebody, so in this case, these were um, bank retail staff uniforms. So somebody could be an, you know, an imposter, you could right. pretend to be a bank That's employee and could, yeah, so, you know, and we have a lot of this um, happening, you know, there's so much made, we over, um, what's the word for it again, sorry, where we um, oversubscribe uh, to our demand, so we over, you know, over production, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, depending on, you know, there was the case in Burberry a couple of years ago, where it yeah. came to light that they were yeah. burning, what, their overproduction, but that this is this is not new in industry. And yeah, this is kind of anybody in industry knows that this is common practice. So there is so much waste that is endemic to the industry and so many people doing a lot of practices, whether they're using post-consumer waste, pre-consumer waste, trying to, and, and that's, this is just the material waste issues. We also have people obviously trying to campaign for um, better human labor rights, um, you know, trying to do better, show different ways of doing. Sometimes industry um, maybe lacks the time to trial new methods and new techniques for, um, for making things better, um, to setting up different practices. So I, I think all of this change can come from many, many different places. And for those of us that are in this field for a long time, maybe we have gained the experience, the knowledge, and maybe maybe a little bit more um, clout or maybe um, mm, to actually, mm. you know, affect. And I also um, put my name to a white paper recently for the, that's gone to the New Zealand government that is looking at in improving waste management systems for textiles within New Zealand as well. So, yeah, there, there's just so many ways of, um, of, you know, as a critic and conscience of society, which this is a role I take very, very seriously, that is what a an academic is meant to be and yeah. within whatever respective field it is we have a, a duty to to make a change and um you know have our voices heard whether that be through the media or act getting our kind of getting stuck in getting our hands dirty and trying to you know do something that actually makes change so um yeah we can cause a ripple effect through absolutely all of our activities absolutely fantastic so how did you get into teaching? Yeah, um, so I think, um, yeah, th this one, I, I didn't plan on going into teaching, but um, I think being the eldest child of three, there's part of that kind of role that comes with <laughs> teaching, although I probably learn more from them. <laughs> um, they're very wise um, siblings, but um, I'm the child of a drama teacher. My mother's um, an amazing speech and drama teacher and stories have come to light more recently that um, my Montessori teacher, apparently I would assist her with teaching the other students from a very young age. So I, I don't know, I must've been about three or four at the time. Maybe, yeah, I, I didn't see that demarcation of roles and I just wanted to share knowledge. So I've, I've always been incredibly curious about everything that in the world, um, you know, I'm passionate about learning in all forms. Um, I was really interested in science, but also creativity. And um, that kind of became amplified as I got older. I, yeah, I found it hard to choose whether to go to, university psychology was something I was really interested in or art and design school somewhere along the way yeah design at that particular time um, was the thing that seemed to kind of click into place 
and yeah, I spent a few years working in industry across the globe. Um, but little by little, as I started to work in industry, I felt that not everything was um, as glossy as it had seemed. Um, I felt a little bit disenfranchised or a bit despondent with how the industry was going and spiraling a bit out of control. Mm. I was really starting to kind of struggle to find meaning or purpose in this industry that seemed to be driven by profits over value. And for me, um, going into, so I witnessed waste accelerating mass production in the USA um, when I worked in there and kind of chasing the needle across the globe. I worked for a heritage brand in Ireland that was had been there for oh, about 100 years um, and was was just starting to go offshore and seeing how that kind of started to impact on the local communities. So I felt quite powerless within that system, but I knew there had to be a bit of a different way. And it brought me to academia. Um, again, that role of being a critic and conscience of society was something that really, really appealed to me. And I wanted to strike that balance between creativity and critical thinking. And, you know, as I've said, I, I feel this is your part of your privilege to teach the next generation of progressive radical designers but you're also building and gaining that new knowledge and working directly with industry so for me it, it feels like a very rewarding place to be and 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 suits maybe <laughs> my character fantastic fantastic so what are the challenges that um so we've all we've all faced in in the, in the past couple of years what would you highlight any sort of challenges that you that you faced challenges in in teaching for, for the, or, yeah for the change for the change in teaching and learning and uh, sort of uh, long yeah and, yeah um i suppose the most immediate one would be in um in our covid environment yeah. um how <laughs> yeah the very very abrupt um move to going online was um you know without maybe any kind of forewarning back in march of last year and any real experience of doing it so so fully, um, I've been 14 months now teaching entirely online. And, um, and, I, and I have to say, you know, initially it was without any preparation and was kind of, okay, let's make the best of this situation. But it's, um, it's been so rewarding in mm -hmm. so many ways. Um, one of the things I love about it is um, that you're kind of occupying the same space and so much about our physicality, our verb, the architecture of our academic institutions is set up in a certain way that, you know, while the kind of role of educator is not so much on high um, and not being questioned as it may have been in the past, but I think so much of it still sets up a hierarchy of teacher here delivering information, um, you know, and, and it's, I, I find in the Zoom space that sometimes it's, you're all in it together. We're all, we've all been spread across the globe in different time zones. And there's a kind of solidarity in being completely thrown into a new situation altogether. So I think there's been like really different kind of conversations that have been sometimes more revealing or more, um, a bond has been struck a closeness and, um, and, and I also find, you know, a lot of it about it is quite, it, it prioritizes um, communication. And so for, as someone who is trying to teach systems, this, this has actually been a really good place where sometimes in the classroom, the studio environment, the physical made object can take priority. Whereas in a system space, it's, it's trying to get that meta view, that bird's eye view and that communication of how everything works together and, and that sometimes can work a bit easier in a digital space where you can refer to things very easily where um, you know you can use mirror boards mural boards yeah. really easily that actually map systems really really well um, you know and you don't have to deal with kind of um, technical issues of a classroom it's it's all you know obviously there is technical issues sometimes um, internet wi-fi can go in and out but it, it, yeah i think it just lends itself really well to that also like that you're able to get contact um, incredible people from across the globe yeah. to come on board as guest critics um, so anytime we had an open studio we had people from all across the globe from industry to other academics and sharing and disseminating that knowledge in real time i think was incredibly powerful 
um, and you know the students making connections across the globe was was really really amazing um, yeah so I think there's been actually a lot that has has been great about it and, and been really accessible. I've also established a, a wholly online asynchronous course. Mm -hmm. um, it's a certificate course for um, continuing education. So mainly adult edge uh, learners that are actually working in industry. So a lot of them ha are running labels or they're um, trying to get into the industry. And this course was about putting sustainability into practice in their in oh. their careers so they could do that at any time in the week so I think it was about three hours of 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 time that they had to dedicate to the activities and the courses but they could fit it in around their homeschooling their full-time jobs um, and so what we developed was a series of of videos and resources that they could access at any time mm -hmm. so I, yeah I thought that again was another good thing but um yeah, I think with every challenge, we kind of rise to the, you know, there's a necessity to kind of meet the learnings. And um, and also, I think one of the great things that's come out of it is, you know, there was so much technology at our fingertips, but we weren't necessarily using it because we didn't have to. And necessity can be, you know, the old adage, the mother of invention, or even just giving us that space in the top, that, that virtual and digital was as real as it got for us that that yeah. was all we had or in this the last 14 months so even our students have been exploring what can fashion be does fashion have to be a physical material could it also be um a, a vr and ar ai um you know a filter application and what what can that space between body and and clothing be in a you know it suddenly felt more real than ever before mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of opened and expanded the the boundaries of fashion a lot more we had students um going on github and different gaming kind of platforms for uh, developing different projects so suddenly those lines between um our discipline are blurring and in lots of different directions um, and it's quite exciting that's very interesting how do you uh, deal with apprenticeships and the fact that uh, it's not so easy for, for students to access physical working spaces? Uh, mm -hmm. And how, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, so th throughout the pandemic, a number of our students yeah. continued to do internships yeah. um, or apprenticeships, but they just did it remotely as as they've been doing their studies and doing their socializing and doing probably everything in this environment. So, you know, a lot of um, our work can be done online. You know, a lot of this work, a lot of our students um, would end up doing social media as part of their role, doing um, communication. Yeah. And so a lot of the file sharing, um, some students have been using things like Clo 3D, which is a virtual um, imaging platform, which allows you to easily design the the um, the pattern piece, the kind of usually the flat, like technical yeah. lay plan of yeah, the yeah. garment. But um, but you can do that on software, and then you can get a 3D representative representative of that um, on an avatar. So all of that can be done digitally and remotely and you could be based anywhere in the world so some students were doing things like that some students were you know um what else were they doing i think yeah social media and um uh, administrative work or yeah, of course um, sketching design work but do you feel that yeah, they could get it, they could get the experience of being in a company like the production and sort of the idea of yeah, production um, design and sort of the mm -hmm. process of being in in, in, in a company I, I I think there's obviously things that are are maybe different about it, but um, the reality of you know so many companies now have shifted to production elsewhere. Yeah. So you know certainly even when I was working in New York, the production was done in China and the design and merchandising was done in in LA and. Um, yeah. New York and they were all completely separate entities so 
it's it's not completely just similar to what the kind of separation that has happened yeah. within our industry as it is it's it's usually the kind of smaller ateliers that would have everything done in house but they are um and and yeah it depends what end of the industry some of the students want to go in and some still have managed to do that obviously complying with um yeah. covid proto protocols and that so um yeah there's been at different stages of the pandemic still the ability to do that but but you know i think like all of these things it's it's also asking you know what kind of career do they want and do they want some of them maybe do want to remain in their locality like i think that's one of the things about everyone having to kind of flee back to where they were from yeah. our students were in canada um korea india um different parts of the states and and what it could actually do for the local industries there so some of them were working with secondhand um suppliers in their locality um they were working with um yeah d different manufacturers in their locale and and i think that could be a real fresh you know injection of of new ideas into these areas so that it's not as congested in the dominant fashion capitals, you know, a more distributed um, network of, of hubs of, of manufacturing or hubs of design activity across the globe, closer to, to the point of purchase, closer right, and, and right. speaking of the place that they're in rather than, you know, what's kind of happened with fashion is that we've got these, you know, dominant centers that are making increasingly homogenized clothing made somewhere else that don't really speak of the place that they're from yeah, or speak yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of the traditions or the skill sets, you know, existing in the area. So yeah, I, I, I would question that we, yeah, that we need to kind of prop up what we've already, already been doing. So do you I feel we need to, rec good, yeah. you feel we need to Sorry, reconnect production to, to design? or yes yes yeah and place 100 time and place you know recognizing that there's many different speeds we did not all of the speeds need to be fast that we can have different lifetimes different time frames for production use and disposal um i think we we need to actually consider the entire life cycle of a garment um, from raw material from agricultural um, plant or you know extracted from our earth um, right through to disposal and not be yeah we've been quite myopic and compartmentalized in our thinking fantastic if there were no limitations for 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 design education you could do whatever you like would you do something differently would you change anything um Yes, <laughs> I would, <laughs> but uh, I could, yeah. Um, I, I think there's design education is um, moving, you know, in, in a good direction in, in many ways, but um, I think we could put a more ha radical hat on. Um, I think I, I really look to places like Finland. I, I think they're, you know, obviously one of the, the leading countries in the world for education and I think we could really continue to break down silos and teach and act in systems a lot more I, I think the phenomenon based teaching or teaching by topic that has been happening in Finland for a number of years rather than simply teaching in subjects very separately um, I think that that's really empowering and, and something that um, the fashion systems pathway attempts to do or tries uh, that we do at Parsons, but I think we could see much, much more of that. Um, and I think, you know, we could be looking at topics like climate change and looking at it through a historical lens, a geographical lens, looking at it from economics, looking at it from fashion design. And we could all simultaneously be discussing these topics and working together um, towards more kind of shared issue based, more collective collaborative um, solutions. And, and I think, you know, that kind of prioritize instead of like memorizing facts and figures, but accepting knowledge as it is, and we'd focus more on, and accepting knowledge as it is, but we could look at more understanding, analyzing and interpreting. And I think it would be much better for the role of design or for designers working with other disciplines and connecting things a lot more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Fantastic. How can our viewers and listeners find you? <laughs> um, well, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, um, you might be able to share those links. Um, mm. Instagram also. Um, yeah, um, my email, I can link that as well. I'd love to hear from people who think think similarly or even think differently. Actually, it's always um, stimulating to have discussions and dialogues. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Any last piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, as we get into the 21st century, they say it's the century of systems thinking. Um, and I'd love to see design being recognized as the kind of bridging mechanism that it can be to connect other disciplines. Um, and that, you know, we've got a wider range of challenges maybe than we we acknowledged in the 21st century or 20th century. And there's a broader context and greater complexity. And I think design designers are amazing amazing at reimagining redefining and stimulating new ideas and connectivity with that are people and planet centered so i think hopefully it's a, a bold new century for designers and maybe looking at decoupling from um, growth and looking at different like you know we, we could say design was the handmaids of um of capitalism in the turn of the 19th century, certainly fashion was. Um, and I think that the role of designers needs to look at different kinds of relationships with um, making profit, that it, I think we need to look at forging relationships um, with our environment and with nature and designing with nature rather than using it as an extractive tool to plunder. So I think, yeah, all of those things, the boundaries and context for fashion design um, and the outcomes for design need to kind of be more linked to a, a different purpose and different questioning. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming. Thanks so much for your time. And Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's, been, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you so best. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.